Chapter Forty Nine of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter Forty Nine. Countess de Gramont, sixteen forty one. Count A. Hamilton. Miss Hamilton, the eldest daughter of Sir George Hamilton, and born in sixteen forty one was at the happy age when the charms of the fair sex begin to bloom. She had the finest shape, the loveliest neck, and most beautiful arms in the world. She was majestic and graceful in her movements, and she was the original after which all the ladies copied in their taste and air of dress. Her forehead was open, white, and smooth, her hair was well set, and fell with ease into that natural order which it is so difficult to imitate. Her complexion was possessed of a certain freshness, not to be equalled by borrowed colours. Her eyes were not large, but they were lively, and capable of expressing whatever she pleased. Her mouth was full of graces, and her contour uncommonly perfect. Nor was her nose, which was small, delicate, and retroussé, the least ornament of so lovely a face. Her mind was a proper companion for such a form. She did not endeavour to shine in conversation by those sprightly sallies which only puzzle, and with still greater care she avoided that affected solemnity in her discourse which produces stupidity. But without any eagerness to talk she just said what she ought, and no more. She had an admirable discernment in distinguishing between solid and false wit, and far from making an ostentatious display of her abilities, she was reserved, though very just in her decisions. Her sentiments were always noble, and even lofty to the highest extent, when there was occasion. Nevertheless she was less prepossessed with her own merit than is usually the case with those who have so much. Formed as we have described, she could not fail of commanding love, but so far was she from courting it that she was scrupulously nice with respect to those whose merit might enable them to cherish any pretensions to her. Such a portrait, says Mr. Davenport Adams, makes one in love with the woman it professes to represent, and envy might be tempted to conclude that it was rather the ideal of some poetic Diana than a transcript of a veritable flesh-and-blood beauty. Undoubtedly the natural partiality of the brother and the pride of the husband, Count de Gramont, whose united skill has been exerted to produce so agreeable an ensemble, have filled in the outline with two flattering colours and heightened the charms of nature by the graces of art. But when, for this fond exaggeration, due allowance shall have been made, there will still remain enough to justify us in regarding Elizabeth Hamilton as one of the most fascinating women of her age or nation. The highest in rank and the most important of her lovers was the Duke of York, who had been captivated by a glance at her portrait in Lely's studio. His proposals, however, being neither flattering nor honourable, were haughtily rejected. The Duke of Richmond, a gamester and a drunkard, the heir of Norfolk, a wealthy simpleton, the brave and handsome Falmouth, who afterwards died a hero's death in one of the great sea-fights with the Dutch, the two wrestles, uncle and nephew, and the invincible Henry German, in succession acknowledged the power of her charms and offered her their hands. They were refused. The Count de Gramont next presented himself and was more successful, though in moral character he was not superior to his predecessors, and in fortune was their inferior. This celebrated wit, who has become so celebrated to us through the graphic pages of Count Hamilton's memoirs, was born in 1621. Having been banished from France by Louis the Fourteenth for entering himself against that monarch in the lists of love with Mademoiselle La Motte Audencourt, he repaired to the court of Charles the Second, where he immediately became the observed of all observers. He was handsome, graceful, and accomplished. His manners possessed an indescribable fascination. His address was polished and easy, his conversation light and amusing. But his enemies accused him of being treacherous in his friendships, cruel in his jealousies, and trifling in his loves. He was assuredly a man of unprincipled character, and as false towards a friend as he was fickle to a mistress, but an undefinable brilliancy of manners which dazzled every eye, imposed on the judgment of all who he came in contact with, and it was only those whom he had defrauded or betrayed that could distinguish the clinquant from the pure metal. After several years of wooing, the fickle Count de Gramont became the husband of the beautiful Hamilton. But, notwithstanding the apparent warmth and duration of his addresses, it is doubtful whether he really intended them seriously, and his marriage is said to have been forced upon him. Having made his peace with Louis the Fourteenth, he had received permission to return to France. In all haste he set out on his journey, and it is said, without bringing matters to a proper conclusion with Miss Hamilton. 
Her brothers immediately pursued him and came up with him near Dover, resolved to extort from him an explanation or to obtain satisfaction with their swords. "'Chevalier de Grammont!' they exclaimed. "'Have you forgotten nothing in London?' "'Excuse me,' he rejoined with his accustomed self-possession. "'I forgot to marry your sister.' He returned with them to London and espoused the fair lady, Charles the Second honouring the nuptials with his presence. Grammont died at the age of eighty-six, and his wife survived him but one year. End of chapter 49